was God breathed and useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Let's pray together. Father, we pray you would thrill us with your word today in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, there are many books out there that claim to be the word of God. I uh, grew up, I didn't grow up a Christian. I grew up, of course, in a Japanese Buddhist home. Yes, I'm Japanese. Zukaran is Japanese, believe it or not. And I grew up in a Japanese Buddhist home. My uncle's very involved in the Buddhist community. And so when I first heard the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the God of the universe loved me and wanted to be a part of my life. So much so, he came to earth and died upon a cross to make it happen. I was really intrigued with that message, but I asked myself the question, is this really true? Or is this some kind of just another legend or fairy tale? And I realized there's many books out there that claim to be the Word of God. How do we know the Bible is indeed the Word of God, the unique Word of God? If you study the books of all the world religions, they're saying contradictory things, all right? They can't all be right at the same time. Aristotle's law of non-contradiction. And so I began to investigate, and if God exists, we understand God confirms his message with acts of God called miracles. And of all the books in the world, the Bible is the only one that's confirmed by acts of God. Now, there are several, whoops, hey, there we go. There are several evidences for the inspiration of the Bible. In the time that we have together, I'll just go through about four very quickly with you this morning. And for those of you, uh, if you need further information, you can go to our website here, evidenceandanswers.org, and you can listen to some of the great interviews and messages and read some of the articles we have on the brief things we're going to cover today. All right. Now, <clears throat> there are many. We'll just go through a brief today. First is the indestructibility of the Bible. The Bible has been the most scrutinized and attacked book in the history of the world. It has been uh, attacked by historians, computer scientists, by science, by philosophy, by literary experts. And each time the skeptics have been proven wrong and the Bible proves itself to be true again and again. In fact, <clears throat> the Bible has suffered more attacks than any other book. The fact that it is still around as a source of authority and have it proven itself to be historically accurate again and again and again, the indestructibility of the Bible, the fact that it's around for 2,000 years, makes it a very unique book. My mentor, Dr. Norman Geisler, said this, the Bible has suffered more vicious attacks than would be expected to be made on such a book. Bible critics once regarded much of it as mythological, but archeology span has established it as historical. Antagonists have attacked its teaching as primitive, but moralists urge that its teaching on love be applied to modern society. Skeptics have cast doubt on its authenticity, and yet more men are convinced of its truth today than ever. Attacks on the Bible continue to arise from science, psychology, and political movements, but the Bible remains undaunted. It's the words that Jesus prophesied in Matthew 13, heaven and earth will pass away, but my word shall endure forever. I remember <clears throat> uh, there was a book came out in the 70s. Uh, <clears throat> it was from the French Institute of Science titled 66 Errors of the Bible. And today you cannot find a copy of that book around. A few of my friends have that copy. Uh, <clears throat> I've been trying to get a hold of it, but uh, you can no longer find that book today. Recent studies in science and archeology span have dispelled all of those alleged errors. So the skeptics continue to be wrong. The Bible proves itself to be true again and again and again. The fact that the Bible is so attacked and it keeps coming back, proving itself to be true for 2,000 years shows you there's something very unique about this book. The Bible alone has a very unique prophetic legacy. There's no other book that has the record of prophecy as the Bible. J. Barton Payne, in his well-documented book, The Encyclopedia of Bible Prophecy, documents over 700 matters predicted in the Bible, many of which have come to pass. We could spend all afternoon here. I'll just go through a few here. 
150 years before Cyrus the Mede was ever born, in Isaiah chapter 44, Isaiah the prophet predicted and named the, uh, uh, the rise of Cyrus the Mede. In Isaiah 45, he predicted Cyrus would destroy Babylon, would subdue Egypt, and conquer the known world. He also predicted with great accuracy that Cyrus would let the Jews in his territory go home free without paying any ransom. Truly amazing. Daniel, in Daniel chapter 2, predicted the coming empires of Babylon, Persia, Greece, and Rome. Greece and Rome, he predicted their coming hundreds of years before they appeared and describes, if you read the later chapters of Daniel, the events of the Greek Empire with great accuracy. Truly amazing. Here's another interesting one. Jeremiah 31 says, Thus says the Lord who gives the sun for light by day and the fixed order of the moon and the stars for light by night, who stirs up the sea so that its waves roar. The Lord of hosts is his name. If this fixed order departs from me, declares the Lord, then shall the offspring of Israel cease from being a nation before me. In other words, the nation of Israel shall remain until the Lord returns. The Jewish nation would not cease to exist until the end of the age. Empires have come, empires have gone, but the nation of Israel still remains, as predicted in the Bible. If you told the Romans, this nation that you just destroyed its capital and dispersed the people throughout the world will long outlive the Roman Empire, they would have laughed. But Rome is gone. Israel still remains. If you told that to Babylon that conquered the known world and exiled the people into Babylon for 70 years, the Babylonians would have laughed. But Babylon is gone. Israel still remains. Say that to the Persian Empire. Empires have come, empires have gone, but Israel still remains. You know, um, <clears throat> my uh, friend of mine was doing a seminar on a university campus called How to Destroy the Jews. And uh, he was hoping that Jews and, and it would gather a great crowd, such a controversial title, but only a few Arab students ended up showing up. And he said, if you want to destroy the Jews, here how you destroy it according to Jeremiah. You, get a, you make a huge nuclear missile. You aim it at the moon and you blow up the moon. Then you make a, another nuclear missile, a thousand times bigger than that one, and you shoot it at the sun, and you blow up the sun. Then you make a billion more missiles, about a thousand times bigger than that one, and you blow all the stars out of the sky. And that's the way you can destroy the nation of Israel. And when he was done, the Arabs came up to him with a real troubled look and looked at him and said, there must be an easier way. <laughs> but the fact that Israel is here okay, is another evidence of the inspiration and proof of Bible prophecy. Here's another one. Ezekiel 44 prophesies that the eastern gate of Jerusalem shall remain shut until the Messiah returns. And 1543, Sultan Suleiman the Great blocked the gate, and in fact even put a graveyard in front of it, blocking the eastern gate, thus fulfilling scripture unknowingly and when you go to Israel today there you see the eastern gate and indeed it is blocked shut there, here's another one the prophecies of Jesus J. Barton Payne in the Encyclopedia of Bible Prophecy documents there are over a hundred prophecies made of Jesus predicting his place of birth his lineage his heritage not only would he be born a Jew? He'd be born from the tribe of Judah, not only from the tribe of Judah, from the uh, uh, a descendant of King David. It, the descriptions of his life and ministry are described, that he would be known and hated by the entire nation. Very few guys are ever known by the entire nation, and much less hated by the entire nation. Only one in a million, Dennis Rodman's, appear, or... Uh, who else? O.J. Simpson or whatever. Okay? <clears throat> his manner of death, the exact time of his death is predicted. I was on the radio and a skeptic called and he said, could it be that Jesus was just in the right place at the right time, that this guy was lucky? And he manipulated all this and made it happen. And I said, well, if this guy could manipulate where he would be born, exactly how he would die 
exactly the kind of uh, coerce an entire empire, a Roman Empire, to do the things that they did. I said, this guy would have to be God. Okay? The exact date of his death is predicted. The famous Daniel chapter 9 prophecies. If you lay out Daniel 9, the 77s, and you lay it out and you calculate it, you get the exact date of the Messiah's death. Okay? And from our calculations here, it's about April of 33 AD. Now, in my opinion, so Jesus died right around the first week of April, right around there. In my opinion, Jesus died, the death of Jesus occurred March 31st. The reason is, that's my sister's birthday, okay? And that was the worst day of my life, when all her friends would come over and torture me all day and leave me exiled in my room. Well, three days later would make it what? April 2nd. That's my birthday, when all my friends could come over and we could return the favor, you know? But uh, <clears throat> so somewhere right around April predicts the exact day of the death of the Messiah. No other book has this kind of prophetic legacy. Hey, read the Annals of Confucius. How many, what kind of prophetic legacy does it have? Zero. Muhammad, the supposed prophet of Islam, how many prophecies are there in the Quran? Zero. All right. Read the writings of Buddha in his earliest writings, okay, the Pali Canon, about a couple hundred years after the life of Buddha, is probably the closest to the teachings of Buddha that we have. How many prophecies are there? Zero. Okay. <clears throat> the Bible has over 700 prophecies, okay, over 100 just of Jesus Christ alone, which he fulfilled with amazing accuracy. No book with the prophetic legacy of the Bible. Someone who is eternal and omniscient had to put those in an inspired work. And there's no book like it. Study all the annals of history, all the works of literature. You're not going to find one. Now, sometimes people say, well, what about the guy Nostradamus? Didn't he predict a lot of things? No. Read his. They're very vague prophecies there. And he made a lot of prophecies that were false. Remember, in the Bible, Deuteronomy 18, if it's from God, the prophecies have got to be 100% correct. The annals of Nostradamus are filled with errors. Here's a famous one from uh, Century 10, Quatrain 72. Nostradamus predicted the end of the world in July of 1999 with the arise of the king of the Mongols, or the Antichrist, once again. That did not occur. Hey, the incredible legacy of Bible prophecy is another evidence of its divine inspiration. Then we have another fascinating area, the area of archaeology. Christianity is uniquely a historical faith. A lot of the religions out there that I've had the privilege to go to their homeland and study are based, based on myths or legend. Christianity is uniquely a historical faith. Therefore, there should be historical evidence to back up its claims. And there are. There are thousands of historical discoveries that affirm the historical accuracy of the Bible. Dr. William F. Albright is the father of Middle Eastern archaeology. He's no greater authority than he was. And he states this, there can be no doubt that archaeology has confirmed the substantial historical accuracy of the Bible. Another famous Jewish scholar, Nelson Gluick, says this, it may be stated categorically that no archaeological discovery has ever controverted a biblical reference. Scores of archaeological findings have been made which confirm <coughs> in clear outline and exact detail historical statements of the Bible. Donald Wiseman, another great archaeologist, affirms over 25,000 sites confirm biblical events, places, and people named in the Bible. That's absolutely incredible. No book is as ancient with so much historical evidence as the Bible. And in fact, today, we can proudly say one of the foremost authorities on, the Bi on archaeology in the Bible is a Japanese-American. You guys know his name? Edwin Yamauchi. 
who's from Hawaii. He actually went to my high school. I just found out talking to him. And he's a professor at uh, University of Miami in Ohio, perhaps the foremost biblical archaeologist of our time. He's a Japanese American guy. Okay? <clears throat> um, so we can spend all day looking at archaeology, but let me just show you a few examples here. Uh, here's a whole list here. The Hittites, first mentioned in Genesis 15 and in 1 Kings 10, a mighty nation uh, that with uh, horse-driven chariots, one of the first. Little was known about them, and skeptics doubted the historical accuracy of the Bible because there was no evidence that these people ever existed for thousands of years. Finally, in the late 1800s, the <coughs> people were digging in southern Turkey, northern Iraq. They discovered a great city up here, uh, the city of Hattusas, and there they discovered a great library with over 10,000 of these ancient tablets here. These look pretty big in the uh, display here, but they're about the size of a cigarette pack. These guys could write really small here. Okay? Uh, <clears throat> they discovered 10,000 of these ancient tablets, and when he finally deciphered the language, they discovered that they had found the capital city of the Hittite Empire here. And as they further studied the language, they discovered the Hittite language is the forerunner of the ancient Indo-European languages. And now at universities all over the world, the University of Chicago here is the most famous one. There's a whole department dedicated to the study of Hittiteology. Once again, what was once thought to be myths and legend the Bible showed itself to be, once again, another historically accurate book. In fact, on a side note, many of you wonder where the ancient forerunners of the Chinese came from. Many believe it comes from the Hittites. If you study, they got the ponytail, the curved sword, the pointed shoes, the armor. Looks like the terracotta soldiers. If you wonder the ancestor of the Asians, many believe it comes from the Hittites here. Sargon. The king of Assyria, critics many thought that he was a fictitious character because no evidence of him was ever found. Well, in the late 1800s, excavating there in northern Iraq, his palace was discovered. And in his palace was discovered a, a painting of the battle mentioned in Isaiah chapter 20. And there's the famous winged bull, the portraits, and the cylinder of Cyrus, even recording his, uh, the history of his rulership. Here's another one, 2 Kings 19. Many stories, even when I became a Christian, there were many stories in the Bible that I thought were simply fairy tales or mythology, and I had trouble believing them until I studied the archaeology behind them. Now, <coughs> now here... In 2 Kings 19, it's the famous invasion of Sennacherib, king of Assyria, when he came to invade uh, the nation of Israel. And it states that he wiped out thousands of people there in the nation of Israel and came to surround the capital city of Jerusalem. And there, if you know the story, he coaxed the people of Israel not to listen to their righteous king Hezekiah, but to come out and surrender. Hezekiah went into the temple of the Lord to pray, and it says, That night the angel of the Lord went out and put to death 185,000 men in the Assyrian camp. When the Assyrians came out and saw all the dead bodies, they fled back home, and Sennacherib was cut down by his sons, Adrimelech and Sherezer, who later fled, and his son, Eshardan, succeeded him as king. Many thought that this story was indeed a myth or a legend. Well, in late 1800s, we discovered Sennacherib's prism there, or the famous Taylor's prism. And there is recorded the history of Sennacherib's military exploits. And what we discovered was his record of his invasion of Israel. And he talks about his invasion of Israel and how he captured many Israelite cities and deported many of the people. And then when it comes to Jerusalem, he names Hezekiah, as mentioned in the Bible. 
It says that he surrounded Hezekiah, and he says, I had him trapped like a caged bird. I set up in Jerusalem, his royal city. I threw up earthwork against him. The one coming out of the city gate, I turned back to his misery. He talks about how he surrounded Hezekiah, but he never records his capture of Jerusalem or that he ever captured Hezekiah the king. It only records that he suddenly retreated and returned to Nineveh, where he was assassinated by his sons. Well, why doesn't it talk about the massive defeat he suffered there in Jerusalem? Well, remember back then, kings don't record their defeats, all right? Uh, they don't want to put, you know, that I went to Jerusalem, you know, and I got whooped, and I returned home in shame. You know, I'm not going to record that for the uh, children and generations to follow to read, all right? He simply records he retreated from Jerusalem, never capturing the city or Hezekiah. As consistent, okay, his account is consistent with the biblical account. Here in 1993, I remember I was in graduate school, a phenomenal discovery was made. For centuries, skeptics were saying King David must be a legend. He must be like Paul Bunyan or one of these legendary guys because we've never found anything outside the Bible that tells us this king ever existed. Why is it that the greatest of the kings of Israel, we don't have any coin, plaque, nothing mentioning this guy, David. And so they thought it was a myth until a stunning discovery was made just recently in 1993 in northern Israel at a place called Tel Dan. A large black basalt stele or a plaque that goes above government buildings was discovered. And they're written in 13 lines in very readable Aramaic was discovered that this was a plaque created by Ben-Hadad, the king of Assyria in the 9th century BC when he defeated the forces of Israel, which is recorded in 1 Kings chapter 15. And on the plaque reads, I killed Jehoram, son of Ahab, king of Israel, and I killed Ahaziah, son of Jehoram, king of the house of David. Here, the enemy of Israel, the king of Damascus, writing just a few decades after King David's death, acknowledges the existence of King David and that the kings of Israel descend from the house of David. So here, an enemy of Israel acknowledges a historical King David. This discovery ended up dispelling many critics who stated David never existed and that there was no reference ever discovered of him outside the Bible. Here, Pastor Ted and I visited this place. It's up in northern Israel in a place called Caesarea Maritima. Very beautiful stadium is built here. You can stand at the bottom of the stage here. This stadium seats, seats uh, over a thousand people. And without a microphone, you can stand on that stage and uh, talk about as loud as I'm talking here and the acoustics are so great you can be heard at the top of the stands over there. A uh, great place to sing there without a microphone. Well, it was discovered who built this great stadium. Well, in 1963, a plaque was discovered and the Greek words are still there. You can go read it today. And it reads, Pontius Pilate, prefect of Judea, has dedicated uh, the stadium to the people of Caesarea, a temple in honor of the emperor Tiberius. Pontius Pilate, he's the guy that sentenced Jesus to death during the time of Tiberius, the emperor of Rome, as recorded in the Bible in the book of Luke. Also, right around 1968, the bones of a crucified man were discovered. His name is still on the ossuary, Ben Johan Hagago. Six-inch nail driven right through his ankle. Here's the reconstruction there. And they discovered that his shoulder blades were worn down. Obviously, this guy was pulling himself up and down to breathe. Crucified as described of Christ in the Gospels. 1990, in a royal chamber in Jerusalem, was discovered the ossuary of Caiaphas, the priest who sentenced Jesus to death. 2007, in one of the fortresses, the sarcophagus of King Herod the Great was discovered. <clears throat> there are thousands 
of discoveries that confirm the historical accuracy of the Bible. Tens of thousands. And that's only about 10% of what's out there. There's no book that has so much archaeological verification as the Bible. Christianity is uniquely a historical faith. The events it records actually happened in the context of true life history, not legend or mythology. Compare that to something like the, Quran, uh, the Book of Mormon, which states there were many cities spread across the United States and South America, which they named the caliber of Egypt and Babylon. Well, how many of those cities have we found? Zero. Have you ever heard of a Mormon archaeology department? Doesn't exist. All right? Compare that to something like the Bible. Thousands of discoveries continue to be made affirming people, places, and events of the Bible. That's one of the things when I was studying the religions, the Hawaiian religion, Hinduism, and other religions, I saw they were built on a lot of myths and legends. However, when I studied Christianity, I saw it was uniquely a historical faith. These events occurred in the context of real life history. That's what you would expect from something claiming to be the Word of God. Then we have the testimony of science. Now, the Bible is not a scientific book, but when it speaks about the created order, the things it says is indeed true. In fact, only in recent times has science been confirming what the Bible has taught for centuries. The Bible taught that the universe has a beginning. We have now, Einstein demonstrated it through his theory of relativity, but recent discoveries, the red shift, uh, the radiation echo all confirm the universe has a beginning. Remember, for 200 years, scientists thought the universe is eternal. Now we know the universe has a beginning. Many call it the Big Bang. The universe has expanded from a large explosion. It has expanded to where it is today, Isaiah 42. Bible taught that the earth is round. Okay? The Greeks taught that the earth was like a flat plate resting on, uh, on water. All right? That the earth hangs in space all by itself. Hindus taught that um, the earth sits on the back of two giant turtles. There's other Greek schools that taught that the earth is held up by a very large man named Atlas. The Bible taught for centuries the Bible hangs in space all by itself that the universe is custom made for human life the anthropic principle one of the hottest uh, theories in science today that the sea has channels or paths Psalm 8 the hydrological cycle okay? Isaiah chapter 55 that the basic animal forms of life all began at once, that they remained basically the same, and they started fully formed, something called the Cambrian explosion, all right? <clears throat> so although the Bible is not a scientific book, when it speaks of the created order, science has now confirmed the things that the Bible teaches are indeed true. And finally, Jesus a man who claimed to be the divine son of God, who confirmed his claim to his miraculous, sinless life, death, and resurrection. We have a very accurate record of the life of Christ. All the historical evidence points to that he did indeed live a unique life. He died and rose again. The resurrection, one of the best attested to historical events in ancient history. I have debated that on radio. Professors far smarter than I have debated that with the top atheists throughout the world. The evidence for the resurrection has never been beat. Jesus Christ, who claimed to be the divine Son of God, confirmed that claim to his miraculous life, death, and resurrection, affirms the authority of the Bible. And we will have to talk about that next time I come. But all that indicates that indeed what we have here in the Bible is the one and only unique, divinely inspired Word of God confirmed by acts of God. It is the only one. Well, what are the life applications we can learn from our study here today? Well, number one, that this 
book here is indeed the inspired word of God from beginning to end. 2 Timothy 3.16 states that all scripture is inspired of God. The Greek word there means God breathed, breathed out. So when we breathe on a mirror, we get fog. When God breathed, we got the Bible. From beginning to end, this is indeed the unique word of God. Number two, the Bible alone then is the word of God. It's the only one that has this kind of confirmation. Therefore, what it teaches is true, and whatever contradicts the Bible then would be false. If there are other works that claim there are other ways to heaven or eternal life besides Jesus, that would be contradicting the Bible. So ultimately, that teaching would be false. Next, <clears throat> the Bible is not just meant to be studied. Hebrews chapter 4 calls this the living word. In other words, it's meant to be applied to our life. And as we apply, this is God's world. And how do we live in God's world? But according to God's word. And when we apply God's word, we see how it's true and how his principles really work. And as you see it throughout the day, you apply it. This book literally, literally comes to life. It becomes the living word. That's why the Bible calls this uh, itself the living word of God. Finally, <clears throat> it's determinative. How you respond to the teachings of the Bible determines your life here upon the earth and your eternal destiny. Will you receive God's one and only Son, Jesus Christ, as your Lord and Savior? God has spoken to us specifically through His Son and through His Word. This is the greatest news, the greatest book from God to us. His Word the Bible. Those are the just a few of the evidences for the divine inspiration of the Bible. There's no word like it. It's from God's word. It's uh, God's word to us. Many of you, maybe perhaps this is the first time you've ever heard there's compelling evidence for our faith in Christ. We've covered a lot of information. If you want to read up on this, uh, if you want to read specifically on archaeology, okay, Edwin Yamauchi is a great guy to read. He's, he's Japanese, real smart. He's pretty high technical. If you want a guy that's more writing on a popular level, Ra my friend Randall Price, The Stones Cry Out. If you want to study all the evidence for the Christian faith, may I suggest this book, Unless I See, written by a guy, I hope you know, uh, there. Uh, <clears throat> I think he's pretty good, so I encourage you to uh, go get that one. But indeed, what we have in the Bible is like a book like no other. It's the uniquely, divinely inspired Word of God written from God to us. Let's pray together. Thank you, Lord, for your Word. May we study it. May we teach it. May we apply it. May we experience the great joy of seeing it come true in our lives each and every day. In Jesus' name, amen.